Fun fact about me, I love Lego Batman. I love the animation, the characters, the humor. This is MacGuffin Airlines, flight 1138. We are transporting 11 million sticks of dynamite and two best friends. The humor. Nothing bad ever happens to me. The humor. My name's Richard Grayson, but all the kids at the orphanage call me dick. Well, children can be cruel. Yeah. And yes, the rampant queer coding. Batman doesn't do ships. What? As in relationships. I am not gonna be part of a one-sided relationship. Boo boo, look at me. You're too good for Batman. He needs to open his eyes and see what it feels like when you're not around. You're trying to entrap me into a relationship. Really? Yeah, and it's not gonna work. Oh yes it is. Lego Batman is a film about Batman, Bruce Wayne, and his greatest fear. Your greatest fear is being a part of a family again. Batman doesn't want to get close to anyone because he might lose them. Dick, Robin, Barbara Gordon, Batgirl, and Alfred all help Bruce confront that fear and realize he's better off with an open heart. Sometimes losing people is part of life, but that doesn't mean you stop letting them in. This lesson extends to Batman's relationship with the Joker. At the start of the film, Batman refuses to acknowledge Joker as his greatest enemy. And here, the term greatest enemy has a romantic connotation. In the Lego Batman movie, bad guy translates to partner. And I'd say that I don't currently have a bad guy. To fight someone means to date them. Okay, look, I'm, I'm fine with you fighting other people if you want to do that, but what we have is special. I hate you means I love you. I hate you, Joker. <gasps> I hate you too. I hate you more. I hate you the most. It's a gag, yeah, and people can and do claim that's all anyone should take from these moments. But director Chris McKay called their Joker and Batman dynamic the backbone of the film, and I think he's absolutely right. This lover's tiff between Joker and Batman propels the entire plot. It's what drives Joker to make a new evil plan. It's why Batman rises to Joker's bait, which then allows Joker to kickstart the final battle. It's what forces Batman to face his fears and team up with others. And beyond the laughter, there's real heart to these scenes. It's hard not to feel the gut punch when Batman tells Joker, You mean nothing to me. It's hard not to get angry at Batman when he refuses to say he hates the Joker. I hate you. Oh, that's nice. Me too. At the end of the film, when the fate of the entire city depends on Batman's ability to open up to the Joker to win him back, the creators embrace the romantic nature of that premise. Batman reaches out to Joker and delivers a heartfelt speech, lit by a sunset backdrop and underscored by dramatic music, and suddenly I'm all verklempt. You'll help me save us. You just said us. This film works as a romance as well as a comedy. And I know people agree with me on that, because some of them boycotted Lego Batman on the grounds that it was chock full of pro-gay propaganda. What do you say? You had me at shut up. Just shut up. You had me at hello. But there's a reason I find this dynamic so special. When I look at the Batman mythos, at the homophobic nightmare legacy that's dogged this series for decades, I'm struck by the way the Lego Batman movie turns the tables. It treats the romance between Batman and Joker not as a nightmare, but the key to Batman's salvation. Well, to explain that claim, we're gonna need to talk about history. Batman was popular and could also get kinda dark. But ho ho, time for a vibe check. What's that over there? Oh my god. Oh, yes, the early years of Batman were plagued by homoeroticism. Batman and Robin were supposed to share a purely platonic dynamic, 
But due to panels like this one, gay vibes began to accumulate. Grant Morrison, writer of Batman comics such as Arkham Asylum and Batman and Robin, even went so far to say, gayness is built into Batman. I'm not using gay in the pejorative sense, but Batman is very, very gay. There's just no denying it. Obviously, as a fictional character, he's intended to be heterosexual, but the basis of the whole concept is utterly gay. Ever heard of the SNL series, The Ambiguously Gay Duo? Yeah, that's a Batman spoof. Can't keep this up, lifetime companion. Let's go for the break. By the time the 50s rolled around, parents had started to grow wary of comic books, the same way the parents of today are wary of video games. People were concerned that comics caused juvenile delinquency. They're reading stories devoted to adultery, to sexual perversion, to horror, to the most despicable of crimes. Crime and horror comic books stimulate outbursts of destructive violence that might otherwise have been channeled into much less antisocial activity. Then, boy wonder Mr. Frederick Wortham over here shout out a little book called Seduction of the Innocent. He used falsified studies to claim comics swayed kids to violence, disrespect for authority, and of course, gay. <laughs> he described Batman and Robin's situation as like a wish dream of two homosexuals living together. <coughs> In a study of over a thousand homosexual cases at the Quaker Emergency Service Readjustment Center, we found that the arousal of homosexual fantasies, the translation of fantasies into fact, and the transition from episodic homosexual experiences to a confirmed fixation of the pattern, maybe due to all sorts of accidental factors. The bat, the ba the Batman type of story may stimulate children to homosexual fantasies, of the nature of which may be unconscious. <coughs> In adolescents who realize it, they may give added stimulation and reinforcement. The morality of comic books was already widely disputed by the time Seduction of the Innocent hit shelves, but many credit Wortham's book as the match that lit the censorship campaign bonfire. A Senate subcommittee of juvenile delinquency recommended that comic publishers create a system to regulate their content. That decree, along with Wortham's book, forced publishers' hands. They created the Comics Code Authority as an alternative to government regulation. Behold, comic publishers' DNI list. Crime shall never be presented in such a way as to create sympathy for the criminal, to promote distrust of the forces of law and justice, or to inspire others with a desire to imitate criminals. All characters shall be depicted in dress reasonably acceptable to society. Sex perversion or any inference to same is strictly forbidden. Respect for parents, the moral code, and for honorable behavior shall be the fostered. The treatment of live a romance stories shall emphasize of the, problems the of value of the not home a license and the sanctity of slang marriage. Colloquialism Divorce shall not be treated as a If your comic cleared all those points, congratulations! You've met the code criteria. Here's a cool little seal on the cover of your comic that promises parents you aren't going to poison their children's minds with gore, cleavage, or gay people. If you didn't get the CCA seal, chances were no stores would even carry your comic. And so America entered a new age of censorship. Say hello to Reverse Beards, Batgirl, and Batwoman, who were created to make Batman and Robin look less gay somehow. Batman already had the hots for Catwoman, but she made crime seem cool, and that was also on the naughty list. So, yeah, no. The larger cast served another key hetero function. They made sure Batman and Robin were never left alone together. At one point, Alfred the butler was even axed and replaced with some rando named Aunt Harriet, so Wayne Manor would have a female resident. The shadow of the great comic book scare hung over the Batman franchise for decades. 
It took a new avenue of publication, direct market distribution, for comic artists to bypass the CCA regulations, and that didn't occur until the late 70s. To meet the Comic Code Authority's criteria, Batman became a much more silly comic. The TV shows only cemented that standard until America came to associate Batman with this. Your orange juice, sir. Batman special. As restrictions lifted, creators began to play around with a darker Batman. But Frank Miller was the one who drove the real paradigm shift when he collaborated with Klaus Janssen and Lynn Varley to create The Dark Knight Returns. This landmark story stars Batman as a washed up old dude who comes out of retirement after he watches too much Zorro. He goes on to face off with gangs, the Joker, and even Superman. Miller's story ushered in a whole new era of comics, the Dark Age. Gritty comics flooded shelves. It wasn't until the release of The Dark Knight Returns that Americans were able to shake the campy absurdity of early Batman. The gay vibe Batman from The Wonder Years made a few cameos post The Dark Knight Returns, but the general mythos of Batman was changed forever. Batman became dark and mysterious and, oddest of all, cool. Now he's the masked vigilante who takes out whole hordes of gangsters with street smarts and fancy cars and giant muscles. And after he whoops ass, he gets to go home to his mansion and live as a playboy millionaire. Far from the homo vibes of his youth, Batman has become the ultimate straight power fantasy. The alpha male to end alpha males. The hell are you supposed to be? And the Joker. Oh boy, the Joker. The Joker has also gotten darker over the years, and as Batman has become more hetero, the Joker has become more queer. Oh, girlfriend, I just love that shade. As decadent as it is rare. Your beautiful <laughs> hair and skin tones? I have a few makeup tips for you to try. Oh, do share, do share. Chase J made a great video on the Joker the exact ways he's been coded, how queer people might relate to the Joker. I don't have the time to explore those topics, but I will point out that from the start, Joker has boasted campy clothes and a flamboyant demeanor. And then Miller entered the scene. As Miller forever changed Batman's mythos, so too did he change Joker's. Early Batman comics liked to blame Joker's pale skin and red lips on chemical burns, but Miller's Joker applies his own makeup. Miller's Joker calls Batman pet names. Miller's Joker lures the Batman to the tunnel of love for their final confrontation. When asked about the gay aspects of The Dark Knight Returns, Miller responded, Yeah, the homophobic nightmare is very much part of the Batman mythos. It's always been there. I just spelled it out a little more plainly. It's common for Batman stories to reflect upon the symbiotic nature of Batman and Joker's relationship. Joker's crimes create the demand for a caped crusader, and Batman provides the challenge that sparks Joker's desire to commit crime. Miller added a romantic lens to that dynamic, which motivated other creators to do the same. It's now become commonplace to frame Joker's obsession with Batman as romantic. Then why'd he say- Till death do us part. Because he didn't say it to you. It was him all along, wasn't it? It's always been him. In the Telltale series, Joker says, I'm wanting to be like you. Be loved by you. In both Batman Catwoman The Wedding Album and The Death of the Family series, Joker admits to Catwoman that he loves Batman. Wow! If I had a nickel for every time Joker told Catwoman he loves Batman. I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice, right? In the White Knight series, Harley laments that the Joker loves Batman, not her. Christopher Nolan's Joker even lifts a line from the romantic comedy Jerry Maguire. You complete me. You're garbage. You complete You complete me. <laughs> when Frank Miller describes the Batman and Joker dynamic as the homophobic nightmare, he means that the Joker represents homophobes' worst fears. He's a flamboyant, campy weirdo. 
He's obsessed with another man, whom he tries to seduce over and over again, mostly through tricks and acts of violence. He's a predator and a murderer and an anarchist with an agenda to corrupt the natural order of the world, to sow total chaos wherever he goes. In their thesis, Queering the Crown Prince of Crime, a look at queer stereotypes and signifiers in DC Comics' The Joker, Xena writes, The Joker, in many of the stories that his own fans see as iconic, is stuffed into the place of a queer threat. This queer threat isn't just directed at Batman, but at the readers who fear that one day Batman won't beat the Joker's ass the way they want him to. That Batman, a Gary Sue if there ever was one, on top of being a paragon of hypermasculine heterosexuality, will engage in behavior they can't accept and don't see as appropriate in their favorite bat-themed self-insert. And so Batman can never again show a sliver of homo. Revamped as a symbol of pure military machismo badass, he saves Gotham from a symbol of gay evil over and over and over. And finally, we're back. Let go, Batman. <laughs> knock, knock. It's 2017. It's two months till Fire Festival. I'm still at college. The coronavirus doesn't exist yet. The Lego Batman movie drops, and the Batman paradigm gets turned upside down. Most of you will know that not all superhero comics follow the same timeline. Character backstories differ wildly between series. This disparity goes for comic films as well. To make the film accessible to a younger audience, Lego Batman defangs Joker. He's much closer to the silly prankster Joker of the CCA era than the horse arsonist of Death of the Family. I mean, I look at Scott Snyder and Capullo's Joker and I'm scared. I look at Heath Ledger's Joker and I'm scared. This Joker's kind of adorable. It's hard not to feel bad for him. I'm not scared of Lego Joker. He's not abusive to Harley. He still poses a threat to Gotham, but the classic cartoon kind of threat that's pompously non-lethal. Yeah, you yeah, want yeah. us to make the rivers of Gotham City run red with his blood? Oh, that's... Oh, no blood? This Joker has all but been stripped of his status as a queer threat. He's not a homicidal monster, more a fun trickster. He's much more relatable than repulsive. How are your abs, bro? Too much flab, not enough ab. <laughs> Why? And then there's Batman, the badass alpha male, who this film casts as a man baby. There's nothing wrong with it, sir. I've just taken away your computer privileges. You're scheduled to go to Jim Gordon's retirement party. What? No, I don't want to do that. You're going to have a great time. No, no, no. Kind of hard for fans to uphold Batman as the pinnacle of macho badassery when he behaves like such a child all the time. This Batman gets some cool moments here and there. He makes awesome gadgets and takes out Joker and his cronies. But I'd argue that he's at his most mature at the very end of the film when he acknowledges how much his family means to him. So many people were taught that to be a man, you have to bury how you feel. But this Batman can only grow up once he learns how to open up to others. And as Batman points out, that growth wouldn't have been possible without help from the Joker. And if it wasn't for you, I never would have learned how connected I am with all these people. And you. That's why I'm so delighted by this film. To save the day, Batman doesn't have to beat the queer symbol to a pulp or send him to a prison or a hospital. He has to hold hands with him. He has to connect with him. In Flashpoint, Night of Vengeance, Batman's parents survive, but Bruce dies. Bruce's dad becomes Batman and Bruce's mom becomes the Joker. It's okay for Batman to love Joker then, not because the Joker is any less of a murderer, but because she's a woman. In a world where both leads are male, well, outside of fan works, very, very few comics dare to suggest Batman could ever return the Joker's love. And even then, Batman has only ever repressed how he felt or, as with the case of Frank Miller's Batman, sublimated his urges through violence. Because when you're the picture of machismo, that's how you handle gay thoughts. So you live in this mansion uh, alone with another man uh, as he serves you, this butler. I'm not gay. You wanna know how I got these scars? Wasn't it? Gay way, was it? So for Lego Batman to dress this dynamic up as a love story and to treat that as a step towards Batman's maturity, um, wow, kind of blows my mind. 
this film subverts so much of the Batman mythos to create such a positive message about queerness and the nature of true badassery. But hold on, I want to make my position on all this very clear. There's been this demand lately for more dark, messy queer stories. And as long as people like me continue to release the hounds on any queer story with less than spotless morals, creators are going to be really nervous to make darker stuff, and I don't blame them. I know I mostly prefer vanilla fairy tale queer stories, but not everyone's like me, and that's okay. If you prefer the Joker as a serial murderer and Batman as a repressed, gloomy loner, that's fine. Those aspects can make the Joker and Batman dynamic super rich and complex. And I don't blame anyone who's fascinated by the conflict between those two forces. But I'm glad we have variety. I'm glad there's also a story like Lego Batman, where we're made to root for the Joker as well as Batman, where Batman has to work with the Joker to save Gotham, where they replace the queer threat with queer fun. Lego Batman represents a cultural shift to me, where creators and consumers are ready to come at a queer joker from a place of empathy, not disgust, and question the kinds of traits that make Batman cool. Hey, ya squad! What's up? Thank you so much to all my patrons for your support. A big hug to my top patrons, Akiutha Anada, Amy Holschwander, can be coy, Dane, Fonsi, and Jayette. Y'all are the tricksters who keep this channel alive. If you'd like to find your name on this list, or even get previews and early video access, you can pledge to my Patreon. Hope all of you are safe and warm. See ya, sinners!